Many societies have an aristocracy. Arguably, most societies, if not all, do. Um, now, what exactly is an aristocracy? Um, Eric Orwall uses the term loosely, master race, and I suppose he's trying to demystify the idea of having um, the whole term master race. Um, but there are two ways to see a master race. You can look at it, say, in the way that, that the Nazis saw it. And I'm not trying to play Godwin here. I just I want to actually examine the ideas of national socialism, of the German variant, yeah, just by their own merits, not by the horrors that historically uh, developed from attempting to put that kind of idea into place. Um, the Nazis used the term Herrenvolk, which is you know, the race of aristocrats, or the re race of leaders, or the race of nobles, uh, basically the race of masters. Now, their view of it was that the Herrenvolk were the, ones, the only ones who really deserved anything, in any sense, because they were the stronger, and the stronger, by virtue of being the stronger, deserve uh, what they get. Uh, so if they prove that they are stronger, then they have the right to dominate and exploit everybody else. Now, that w that was said quite crassly by people like uh, Walter Dare and Alfred Rosenberg and, um, and Adolf Hitler in Mein Kampf. Now, let's just, that's one view of what it means to be the aristocrat, and that's kind of actually the way that the ancient Spartans saw it. Uh, a lot of the more thoughtful of the Nazis were sort of and there were unfortunately thoughtful Nazis, were inspired by the Spartan model. The Spartans, basically, their only, the only purpose of their civilization was to um, concentrate as much power as possible in the, in the hands of the aristocracy, and everyone else were simply things to be used by the aristocrats. It's kind of the Homeric view of things moved into the classical period. The Athenians, of course, on the other hand, sort of, some of them believed this, but there was a counter-movement, the, you know, the Democrats, democracy, and they were trying to get away from the idea of an, of an aristocracy. Democracy produced its own problems, and we're seeing them actually playing out nowadays. <coughs> now, the point is, though, there's, that's one sort of view of an aristocracy. It, it has the right to plunder everybody else. There are other views, however. Um, there are idealized aristocracies that go all the way back to Plato's Republic. Uh, if we're going to have an aristocracy, and since aristocracy seems to be the natural way of things, uh, why not make sure that our aristocrats are actually certain to at least have the common wheel um, uppermost in their minds? Kind of the anti-Spartans would be um, Plato's philosopher kings, where you know you you, you have these people who are simply born and raised to rule, but in the interests of everyone else, instead of the Spartiates in the Spartan sense, who were born and raised to rule, but only in their own narrow, egoistic um, sense. They, Again, it was their right to plunder and exploit everyone else. Sorry for the noise. Um, <coughs> I have small houses, I keep saying. Um, so the one is not necessarily um, the same as the other. You have, I guess you'd call them utilitarian ar aristocracies, i.e., we assume that this is best for everybody, and we have narrow aristocracies who, who aren't interested in anything outside of themselves. That was how aristocracy was generally understood in the classical world. The Roman Republic was not a republic in the way that we understand the sense. It was meant to keep the, the best people on top. It wasn't meant to to um, be fair or anything like that. It was simply a means of ensuring that the people who actually deserved to rule and deserved to own everything and deserved to have absolute power over everybody else stayed in that position. Um, aristocracies are funny things, and there's many different ways you can interpret them. For example, Eric Orwell is talking, in my interpretation of what he's saying, of an American aristocracy, a projected one, which I think that he's... You know, and, and in all honesty, I think he's trying to say that we will have an aristocracy uh, that will, or I'm positing the idea, I'm sort of imputing this view to him, I hope I'm not strawmanning him, um, an aristocracy that will use its aristocratic status or its superior gifts to benefit everybody. 
that's not the Nazi kind of aristocratic, aristocratic ethic, and it's not the ancient Spartan one or the Homeric one. It's more along the lines of the Athenian one, or the modern one, the modern view of what the upper classes should do. Um, <coughs> there are other aristocracies. Like there's, there is the closest thing the United States has to an actual aristocracy nowadays. I would say are what we call the Boston Brahmins, and there's not very many of them anyway, but they've always been around, or at least you know, for quite a long time. I think John Kerry is one, um, but if you ever heard one of these upper-class Americans, you know, who uh, speak like William F. Buckley did, and it's a uh, very easy, uh, sort of a funny accent to a parody, the way that these people speak, these upper-class Bostonians, although William Buckley was from, was from uh, New York City. But they spoke with what's called a uh, they speak with what's called a mid-Atlantic um, accent. They're just born to an ar aristocratic outlook on life, and just by default, they tend to end up on the top of the heap. Um, they don't really have any power uh, as a caste. It doesn't. People don't just say, "I'm a, I'm a Boston Brahmin, so you do as I say." Um, it's Boston Brahmins have certain attributes that make people automatically sort of respect them. They're born to rule, I guess. They're born to rule in everybody else's interest, and they're born not to be egoistic about it. They're raised that way. It's just this is the way our families work, and I think that they, it is sort of a family-based thing. You inherit uh, the mantle of a Boston Brahmin uh, by virtue of the family you're born into, not because you were born into that family, but that's the dynamics of those families. Um, I think most of them, or a lot of them, tend to trace the lineage back to people who came across on the Mayflower. And again, that's not the reason why. It's just sort of an explanation as to why they are, they've developed this way. These people, as I say, have no power. They, just because you're a Boston Brahmin, it doesn't make you any better than anybody else ever. But they have all the hallmarks of an aristocrat. Uh, they just happen to be upper class and refined in their outlook and manners. They just happen to be altruistic and uh, and uh, utilitarian in their outlook. Um, they just happen to be very um, educated and refined people. Um, a real Boston Brahmin would not be a snob at all. Um, that that involves that that implies too much egoism, and you're straying towards the egoistic type of aristocracy where you believe that everyone else is out there to be exploited. A true Boston Brahmin actually is sort of very superior, and he has something of a aristocratic auteur, but that's simply because he's not going to get down and dirty with the egoism of everyone else. He's going to see the large picture in all, at all times and in all cases, at least stereotypically. I'm sure there are alcoholic, egoistic, uh, criminal Boston Brahmins, but that's generally how they're supposed to be, how the ideal works. Uh, what would you call these people? They're not even really aristocrats because they don't really rule anything, but they end up often in positions of power. They, in fact, they very often, probably more often than anyone else, end up as judges, um, members of the board, chair people of the board, whatever, um, of whatever board you're talking about, it be it a charity or a bank or some more large organization or something like this. But it, they, they get it by virtue of the talents that they're supposed to inherently have, as opposed to, I'm a Boston Brahmin, therefore I'm entitled to do this. Entitlement, that's another thing that an aristocrat actually would not act on. Uh, things like racism. A, a true Boston Brahmin would not be racist. In fact, he recognizes quality wherever he sees it, regardless of what color, race, creed, whatever somebody else is. <coughs> I would say that the Boston Brahmins come closest to the aristocratic ideal in the United States. But they do it just by default. They become aristocrats by default. Eric Orwell seems to be positing the idea of creating an aristocracy or an elect or an elite or something like this. All right, I suppose one could go about doing that, and I suspect that there was some sort of idea of creating the best people in, among the Boston Brahmins as well. Um, but what does that mean? What does it mean to be the best? Does the best mean you have the obligation to lord it over everybody and exploit them? Or does it mean you have the obligation to rule justly, and how do we make sure that that the guardians or the aristocrats don't become the sort of predatory aristocracy as opposed to the utilitarian aristocracy? Quis custodiat ipsos custodes? Who will guard the guards? And again, that's the that's the uh, question that's sort of latent in the Republic, isn't it? Humans have egos.
power goes to people's heads. Power and status goes to people's heads, or go to people's heads. How do you stop that from happening? How do you stop any aristocracy, or master race, or elect, or set of guardians that you come up with from turning predatory on everybody else? That may be an insoluble problem. <laughs>